the reason why we do that is um, we don't broadcast the time of Thanksgiving and we don't broadcast communion and all of that when we do the evening of Thanksgiving. So we put the sermon up front and then also uh, it, it maybe helps stoke the fire a little bit for you. Because on this evening, instead of taking prayer requests, on this evening we want praises only. Not that we don't want to pray for you, and if there are things that we need to pray for this evening, that we will pray for them. But our primary focus this evening is on Thanksgiving. Uh, we want to, to carve out some of our time occasionally. Christians are supposed to be a thankful people, and if we are supposed to be a thankful people, then we must do that in certain ways. And one of the ways that we can do that is by bringing praises to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. So this evening's message, the reason why we read 1 Chronicles 16, is because that's the text for this evening. The text is in 1 Chronicles 16. All that we read is the text. And we're going to break that down four different ways for you. And I want you to think about each one of those four different ways that we have that are going to be broken down. And I'd like this evening for you to focus your praise on the four different ways that we are going to break this text down. I want you, feel free to give praises about other things, but specifically this evening, we want to look at these four different ways, and I hope that this will be uh, some, some fuel for you as you're thinking. You'll be able to stoke the fire, so to speak, and say, how can I be thankful in these specific ways? I was thinking about what Thanksgiving is, and Thanksgiving, obviously, and I want to get this one out of the way, <laughs> because every person that is a follower of Jesus Christ ought to be thankful for their salvation, right? That's the primary thing that we should be thankful for. And so I'm not saying don't be thankful for your salvation, but what I'm saying is that communally, that's the story that we all share, even though everybody's testimony is different. I think about old uh, Dr. Criswell, who used to tell the story. His father had been a cowboy, and his father, when they began to put up fences around the land, his father lost his job as a cowboy, and he became a barber instead. But yet, guys would come in, and they would tell stories, <laughs> And W.A. Criswell would say that he would sit there and listen to the cowboys, the old cowboys telling stories. And one old cowboy told a story about a young cowboy named Jake. And Jake had gotten on a horse that was only partly broken. And when he left, the horse that was partly broken began to kick and buck. And it's hard to get a cowboy off the back of a horse. But this horse, in the midst of kicking and bucking, Instead of getting the cowboy off, the horse lost its footing, and the horse flipped backwards with the cowboy on top of him, and the horse crushed the cowboy. And the cook had seen it all when he ran over to the cowboy to see if he could help young Jake. What's a cook going to do? There's the cowboy laying with his internal organs crushed and blood coming out of his mouth. And The young cowboy said to the cook, he said, would you go get the big black book? that the boss reads to us from. And the cook went and got the Bible, and he brought it back, and he said, I've brought the Bible, Jake. And Jake said, would you turn to John chapter 3 and verse 16? And the cook turned to John 3 and verse 16, and young Jake said, would you lay the Bible on my chest? And the cook laid the Bible on his chest, and the cowboy said, would you put my finger on John 3.16. And he put the fi his finger on John 3.16. And that's how the young boy died. Before he died, he said, tell the boss that I died with my finger on John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I thought about that today, and I thought to myself, boy, I sure hope that when I'm dead, that when you guys parade by me, that Stacy has a Bible laid out on my chest. But I want the Bible that she has laid out on my chest, I want it to be to a different verse. I want it to be to the verse that says, 
he being dead yet speaketh. He being dead yet speaketh. Because that's where our thanksgiving is rooted. It's rooted in what Christ has accomplished for us. We recently considered 2 Samuel's account of bringing the ark to Jerusalem, and I would read for you just the first few verses that we didn't read in chapter 16. In the first few verses it says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. Remember when we went through 2 Samuel's account of them bringing the ark of God up? And they had set it in the tent, and they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before it. This tells us about the cultic practices that were established for ministering before the ark. And when we say cultic, we don't mean it in a bad way. We mean it in in a sense of the ceremonial practices that they establish. And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, and he dealt to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph the chief and next to him, Zechariah, Jeiel, and Shemaroth, and Jehiel, and Mattathiah, and Eliab, and Benaiah, and Obed-Edom, and Jeiel, with psalteries and with harps. But Asaph made a sound with cymbals. Benaiah also, and Jehaziel, the priests, with trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Just a brief prayer. Our Father and our God, we pray this evening as we consider what Thanksgiving is about, that we would focus on the Thanksgiving that David gives and that we would use that as a catalyst for how we live so that we might be a thankful people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I point out to you specifically verse 4, when he appoints these Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord for the express purpose of recording and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Now, what was the ark symbolic of? Do you remember what the ark was symbolic of? It was symbolic of the presence of the Lord. So David finds it important to remind the people that a record of thanks and praise be kept before the presence of God. A record of thanks and praise be kept before the presence of God. I think many Christians get down in the dumps because they forget what they owe. Did you hear that? I think many Christians get down in the dumps because they forget what they owe. God and the presence of God are are so incredible in our mind, it's hard for us to comprehend them. But yet, Sinclair Ferguson tells us that Christians who are convicted of sin are thankful. Christians who are convicted of sin are thankful. I was sharing with uh, Sister Karen Worth this past Sunday on my testimony of my salvation. And my testimony is not anything fantastic when you think of it in terms. And, and I, I, obviously you can tell I've been listening to W.A. Criswell sermons. And W.A. Criswell was talking about how He heard one man say at testimony time that he had seen a fireball come down from heaven and hit him and knock him out, and and that's what had turned him back to the Lord. And and he said he heard another man get up and say that he, uh, he had seen an angel come down, and he said, my story was, my mother said to me as a young boy, W.A., don't you want to choose Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And he said, that was my story. And he said, so I prayed and I asked the Lord to give me all this. He said, and it was like the Lord brought it to my attention that if I were to stand in front of the gates of heaven and I were to say, what is to bring me into heaven? He said, if I were to respond a fireball, he said, then the Lord would say, depart from me, I never knew you. And he said, it's almost as if I could hear Satan in the background snickering and saying, ha, 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 I sent that fireball. Or, ha, 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 I sent that angel in disguise. He said, but then I thought about it, and I thought that the only thing that is going to get me into heaven is Jesus. 
And so when I think of my testimony, my testimony is simply this, that at seven years old, Christ revealed to a little boy that he needed a great Savior. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Eternally grateful. But at seven years old, how much sinning, practically speaking, in the world's eyes does a seven-year-old accomplish? Well, enough to send them to hell, right? But yet in the same sense, there's, there's an essence of having to remind myself on a regular basis just how much I owe Jesus. Just how much I owe Jesus. I was not seven years old sitting with a, a pack of cigarettes and a, and a bottle and the Lord saved me and I threw them away. That's not how it worked in my life. I was a kid who tried to be good. I was At that point, I was an only child. It was just before my sisters were born. And I had tried to be good for mom. The worst thing I had done, I thought, was I had sliced my mother's cornea by accident. I was a fearful child, and I was afraid. Uh, and uh, uh, on TV, do you remember Freddy Krueger? Freddy Krueger came on TV in a commercial, and it scared me, and I jumped up and Mom, and I had a piece of cardboard in my hand, and I sliced her cornea with the cardboard. But yet at this young age, I became aware of the fact that the presence of God was needed in my life. I say that not to exalt self, but to remind you that your testimony probably sounds different than that. And if it does, that's okay. <laughs> the testimony that you have in Christ Jesus is, of the res is the result of the fact that at some point you became aware of the fact that you were a needy person. That's where our thanksgiving flows from, from recognizing that we are a needy people. And God has chosen to dwell with these needy people and to supply their needs. Therefore, we ought to be a thankful people. Knowing that you are a sinner reminds you of just how great God's grace is and just how thankful you need to be. So if you came in this evening and you thought to yourself, boy, I'm thankful for food, I'm thankful for this. Yes, yes, be thankful for all those things. But be thankful for the fact that you became aware of the fact that you were a sinner. Because until you knew that you were a sinner, and until you knew that Christ was the Savior, you really had nothing. David says, Remember what God has done and give thanks and praise to him. Then David establishes a pattern for this praise. In verse 7, David says, deliver something to Asaph to declare. Now, if you, if you see it, 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 it's hard in the English to, to, to say, well, he delivered something. Well, in the Hebrew, you'll note in the English that this psalm is in italics. And I believe that the KJV supplies for us the right something in the italicized words, that it is a psalm, because later on we see that it's revealed uh, in a psalm-like pattern, and Asaph was the one who was the chief of this particular ministration. And portions of this psalm are found, this psalm that is here in chapter 16, portions of it are found in the 96th psalm, in the 105th psalm, and in the 106th psalm. And Asaph is tasked with using this psalm of thanksgiving before the Lord. So let's consider it. I just want to point out to you a few key themes that maybe you picked up as we were reading them. The first major theme that we read in the text is L-O-R-D capitalized. Sixteen different times it appears in the text. That's the main thrust. Thanksgiving comes by focusing on the God of thanksgiving. That's the main thrust of thanksgiving. This is the covenant name of God. Thanksgiving is rooted in the glorious truth that God will treat with his people. The second theme is tied with that. It is the covenant of God. Because God keeps his covenants 
we can rejoice, we can be thankful. The third theme is the glory of God. The very glory of God is a reason for thanksgiving. The glory of God, do you know what the glory of God? The glory of God is, it is the beauty that comes from the attributes of God. So I thought about it this way. When you pile all of his attributes together, you see a beauty that is unmatched, unfading, and unveiled. It all comes out in the glory of God. The fourth theme in this psalm is singing. If you know who God is, then you want to sing to him. And you want to sing the songs that honor him. The fifth theme is that of verbs. And you have to remember back to English, what are verbs? They're the action in the sentence, right? They're the things that tell us what the sentence is doing. And here we see in, in throughout this psalm, we see verbs drive it forward. We are to give thanks. We are to give praise. We are to fear God, and so on and so forth. But all of this is the result of the strength of our God. If we know who God is, really know. You understand what I'm saying? Really know. Because there is... There is a pattern that sometimes builds up in good church people. It's the pattern of being stuck in a rut. You come to church, you hear the word of God, you go out and you say, thanks pastor, nice sermon today. And then you go on about your day and you forget about everything that you heard. But as long as you can keep God really in focus, it does something to you. It changes your perspective. You see that it is his strength that carries you through every hour and every moment of every day. That's our God. Where did God accomplish all of this at? We see it most clearly at the cross. And we rejoice at the cross. Well, the text itself breaks down, as I said earlier, into four different uh, 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 portions. The first portion that we see is in verses 8 to 12. And it is that Thanksgiving, if we're asking the question, what is Thanksgiving about? That's the title for this evening's message. What is Thanksgiving about? If we're asking that question, then we must respond that Thanksgiving is about action in verses 8 to 12. Each of these five verses call the Christian to action. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are called to action. In verse 8, you are called to give, to call, and to make. You are to give thanks to God. Tell Him what you are grateful for. You are to call upon His name, not in a request fashion, but in a joyous fashion. You are to make known His deeds. That's to tell others about God and what he has accomplished in your life. Then in verse 9, we see uh, even further more verbs. We are to sing and to talk. We are to sing unto him. We are to sing specifically psalms unto him. We are to talk of his wondrous works. In verse 10, we are to glory and to rejoice. In verse 11, we are to seek. In verse 12, we are to remember. Thanksgiving is never, ever, ever about inaction. Thanksgiving is never, ever about doing nothing. Thanksgiving is always about action. But this action is not aimless action. Have you ever seen aimless action? We live in the generation of fidget toys, right? Because, why do we live in the generation of fidget toys? Because kids aren't tired enough. Because they don't go outside and play. Because they don't go outside and and have to chop wood anymore. So they have all of this energy. Have you ever heard an old person look at a young person and say, boy, I wish I had that energy. And they are using this energy for what? Fidget spinners clicky little things, bubble things. They've got to have something that entertains them because this is the generation that stares at screens all the time. And so they have aimless energy. 
Well, Thanksgiving is never about aimless energy. The energy of Thanksgiving is always directed towards God. The energy of Thanksgiving is always directed towards God. It's always about Him. It's always in response to Him. How great He is. How good He is. How wonderful He is. How marvelous. How matchless. How precious. And we respond with thanksgiving. That is the heart of the action. So thanksgiving is about action. Thanksgiving, the second way it breaks down, is it is about history in verses 13 to 22. God has acted on us in our need, and we react with thanks. That is the good and right way. So David wants Asaph to rehearse God's actions. And he begins in verse 13 by saying, O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. We've been chosen. Because we are chosen, our action, our our history, and our future has been radically changed. We are defined by the choice that the God of all heaven has made. Wow. And that should cause a response in us. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Paul put it this way in Ephesians 1 when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be found holy and without blame before him in love. And that is the beginning of a burst of praise that Paul gives that goes on for something like 13 verses in Ephesians 1. And it all originates in God's choice. It's about our history. Verse 14 talks about judgments. His judgments are in all the earth. He is fair and equitable. He is God. The God of all righteousness will do right. The God of heaven rules from his throne. And this is, this is encouraging to the Christian. And so we see that our history is held in the hands of the righteous judge. That should make us say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are the one that holds history. It's not anybody else. Listen. There is not some great cosmic struggle where the God of heaven is fighting with Satan over souls in this earth. I love how Martin Luther put it. He said, even the devil is God's devil. Which means what? God is the sovereign God. He is not, Satan is not on the same level as God. God holds all of history, and all of time at His command, and He will judge rightly. And for that, the Christians stand in awe and say, Thank you, Lord. Our history is held in His hand. His covenants in verses 15 to 17. We talked about it. On Sunday, I mentioned to you about, we we were dealing with the Davidic covenant. And we were dealing with the praise and the thanksgiving that David gives forth as a result of the Davidic covenant. And we see that God has written history through these covenants. They are woven throughout time in such a way that God has determined, the Noahic covenant tells us, that God has determined that there will be stability in the earth. The Abrahamic covenant tells us that there will be a promise that God has made that will be accomplished. The Mosaic Covenant tells us that God has written His law. The Levitic Covenant tells us that God has determined His praise and how we worship Him. The Davidic Covenant tells us that God will have a ruler. And the New Covenant says that we have a righteous Savior in Jesus Christ. And when we take 
communion is the symbol of that new covenant. The fact that God makes covenants, and it's interesting with me, if we were to consider all the covenants, we would need, it took me six sermons to get through the covenants down at Chris's church, but if I were to just point you to one to show that, I'd point you to the Abrahamic covenant, and I would say to you, look how the Abrahamic covenant is sealed. Abraham tears apart the bodies of all these different creatures, lays them on one side and on the other side. And what's the purpose of that? The purpose of that is simply Abraham, the, 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 way, the reason why they would do that is because when they're making covenants, they would say, well, if I break the covenant, let me be like the beast that's torn apart. And then Abraham stands off to the side and he shoes away the birds of the air to make sure nothing bothers them. And then he, he does what? He does something very spiritual. He falls asleep. And a smoking flax goes through. And God makes a covenant with himself. And Abraham's the innocent bystander off to the side. God has said, I'm a covenant-keeping God. And because of that, we give thanks. Verses 18 to 20 shows how he protected Israel. And it rehearses their history. And it says, look at how this event has happened, and this event has happened, and this event has happened, so that God could guide and protect Israel throughout all of these different historical portions of their life. How he protects them from the kings, how he protects them from Pharaoh, how he redeems them out of Israel. And we have almost the same story. How God has redeemed us, not redeemed out of Israel, but redeemed out of Egypt. How God has redeemed us out of the Egypt of this world. How God protects us through history. How he kept us alive to the moment of our salvation. And how he keeps us after our salvation. It's incredible. When you think about it, I think to myself, I got upset because I didn't go on vacation with my family one time. The one time my family decides to go on vacation. One time. Listen, you see my mother. She's probably watching this evening. Takes a stick of dynamite to get her out of the house. (laughs) And they somehow got her to go on vacation to Virginia Beach. And I didn't get to go. Why? Give me a wall. Give me a squiggly, give me a mart. That's the reason why I didn't go. I had to work. But in the midst of that, I spoke at a conference while I was at home and the family was away. And guess who was at the conference? Somebody named Stacy. And I met her. And the night I met her, I said, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And six months later, we got married. And I think to myself, how thankful I am that God controls my history. Think of your history. Where did God bring you from? And how can you thank him for it? The third way this breaks down is thanksgiving is about God's character in verses 23 to 30. In verse 23, he is a saving God. And it's almost as if you can sense the building in the literature as David is writing. In verse 23, he is a saving God. In verse 24, his glory and his works must be declared among the nations. In verse 25, he is great and to be feared. In verse 26, he made the heavens. In verse 27, his place is a place of beauty. In verse 28, he is worthy of praise. In verse 29, worship him. And in verse 30, he stabilizes the earth. And it's almost like as you read each verse, it's like, wow, David, you're really laying it on. And if we were in an African-American church and that was going on, you'd hear the people that start humming. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd hear it going as you'd build. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> Somebody would be hollering from the back, Ah, glory! <laughs> As it builds over and over to the point where David is saying, look at the character of our God. Marvel at it. 
Be thankful for it. It's because of God's character that we tonight have salvation in this place. Wow. The final way that it breaks down. If Thanksgiving is about action and Thanksgiving is about history and Thanksgiving is about God's character, Thanksgiving is about expression. In verses 31 to 35. Verse 31 has our response as gladness. The heavens are glad, the earth rejoices, the men speak among the nations, the Lord reigneth. It's all about expression. It's all about gladness and rejoicing at the knowledge of our Lord reigning. Verse 32 then says, look at how the earth rejoices. Even verse 33 too, the sea roars, the fullness thereof, the fields rejoice, all that is therein, the trees sing at the presence of the Lord because he cometh to judge the earth. Verse 34 tells us to give thanks. That's an expression. Give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And verse 35 tells us to say, say ye, Save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, heathen, that we may give thanks to the holy name, thy holy name, and glory in thy presence. And it all builds to the conclusion in verse 36 that says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, you see, at this point, they couldn't hold themselves back. All the people said amen and praised the Lord. Wow. Blessed. Amen. Praise. That's the direction of thanksgiving. You know, you cannot be both thankful and bitter. It's really hard. You can't do it, you know. We as humans have a hard time focusing on more than one thing. Thankfulness demands our attention. When we are at our most thankful, we are at our most focused on God. When we are at our most thankful, we are at our most focused on God. For my class, the new... Um, set of assignments dropped this week and I did the first one yesterday and today the first one was I had to listen to 12 different sermons from 12 different preachers I've listened to sermons yesterday and today from Martin Lloyd-Jones Donald Gray Barnhouse W.A. Criswell John MacArthur there, there were 12 different sermons that I had to listen to and by the time I got to the last sermon as I was sitting there and listening to it, tears were running down my face. Why? Because I had just spent two days focused on God. Two days staring full in his lovely face. And that demands a response. Praise, amen, thanksgiving. So we need to use this time of year wisely we need to use it as a catalyst for bringing us into thanksgiving with our god amen well this is your opportunity now we'll turn off the camera